Referring to when there is a need for additional support, referring child concerns, the IEP process, and valuing children and families. This training will cover required screenings, documenting parent and staff concerns, and individualized activities. We will also spend a little bit of time discussing assessments, the referral process, and supporting an IEP. The two screenings used when a child starts each year are the DIAL-4 and the DECA-P2. The DECA-P2 is the social-emotional screening that provides information about children's initiative, self-regulation, attachment relationship, total protective factors, and behavior concerns. Parents complete the screening during enrollment, orientation, or their first home visit. The teacher version of the questionnaire is entered after the teacher has observed the child in the classroom for four weeks, but both assessments must be entered within 35 days of their first day of class. Once both assessments have been entered into the DECA website, results will be generated. These need to be entered in the Child Plus system in the Education system section under the Events tab. This event should already be created for you and will say DECA P2 Pre. Start by clicking on this event. A box like this one will appear. All of the boxes you see here with black arrows must be filled in. The assessment expires one year after the event date. Always make the status as completed or reports will indicate that you have not done it yet. In the results section, you can either write WNL for within normal limits or PD for potential delay. If you enter PD, it needs to be followed by the areas of, co of concern as shown here. The red arrow is pointing to the needs section. Nothing should be checked here if the results are within normal limits. However, if there is a potential delay, check the box labeled follow-up assessment as an indicator that the pre-referral activities will start. Then scroll down to enter the actual scores in the boxes. Below the section for parents results is the section for teacher results. Please enter in both sets of results. Do not worry about typing in need, typical, or strength, as that will happen automatically when you click the Save button. The Dial 4 is the screening tool we use to measure motor concepts and language development. These sections are performance-based and designed to identify young children in need of further diagnostic assessment, and is appropriate for children ages 2 years 6 months through 5 years 11 months. The dial generally takes about 30 to 45 minutes to complete and is available in both English and Spanish. Like the DEC FP2, the dial results are entered into an event in the education section. The page that opens is also the same except it does not have a section below to enter the scores. That is done on a different screen. So be sure to enter the date the event took place, which is when the screening was completed. The expiration date is one year later. Then enter WNL or PD as the case may be. And again, if there is a potential delay, type in the areas of concern. Remember to also check the box labeled follow up assessment if there is a concern. After saving the event, click on the tab labeled education information. Below the education notes box, you will see this section labeled dial. Enter the date of the screening in the first column and the results in the boxes below it. Then in the next column, type OK or PD depending on whether it was an area of concern or not. It will be a little bit different for your returning students. Before entering the results of the current dial, you will need to clear out the OKs and PDs. Before you delete them, Add the letter K next to the scores in the first column, which were OK, and P's next to the ones that were potential delays. Then you can erase the items in the second column and enter the current results. Be sure to enter the OKs and PDs for this screening in the third column. And if you happen to have a third year student, just repeat the same thing, only you're going to be doing the K's and the P's right next to the score in that third column. 
If there's a potential delay from either the dial or the DECA, the concerns need to be entered in the disability section under the tab labeled concerns. When you click add concern, a screen opens to allow you to enter in the concern. The date identified is the date of the screening. Then you should select the areas of concern. The category choices are cognitive, fine motor, gross motor, language, and social emotional. Potential delays identified in the DECA are entered, are entered as social emotional. Next, select the status option. The status choices are complete intervention or referral needed, intervention or referral not needed, need more information, and pending. Initially, you will enter needs more information and a short note of the information you plan to gather. Be sure to add the teacher as the responsible staff. Once you save, the concern will appear on the main screen as shown here. You should update this each month by clicking Add Activity. Here's an example of the screen that comes up. In this case, the teacher and family have agreed they would like the mental health specials to observe. Once the family signs the A77, enter the referral here. This is an internal referral and the person they are referred to is also selected. Status should be awaiting staff and the teacher is the responsible staff. Be sure to make a quick note about the referral and remember you still need to contact your mental health specialist to make the referral. This is just documentation that it was done. If it is decided they should be referred for an outside evaluation, select external referral and who they are being referred to. Most often this will be the school district. Identify which school district in the notes section, then mark awaiting parent consent. Add this activity as soon as it is determined that an external referral should be made. Once the parental consent is obtained, add another activity which is basically the same except now the status is parent consent obtained and you should click the referral box. Again, add notes indicating where the referral was sent and how. If the school evaluates the child but determines they are not eligible, make note of it in a new activity. Be sure the status reflects not eligible for services and click the first two boxes under evaluations. This shows what all of this activity will look like on the main screen. It is very important all activity completed to assist in the referral process is documented here. You can then close the concern by first highlighting the correct concern, then selecting not eligible. The responsible staff and a short note indicating what happened. As you can see in the boxes on the right, there are seven options available for you to close a concern. If an IEP is created, first add an activity stating the updated status, then close the concern excuse me, close the concern. After that, click on the IEP tab and the green Add IEP button. Here you enter the date the IEP was started, who the LEA is through, typically the school district, and make note of which school district in the notes. The next IEP review should be completed one year after the initial date. Now this part is really important. When selecting the disability type, check all boxes that are addressed in the IEP. Then click on the blank spaces next to them in the priority column. A magical drop-down menu will appear. Make sure every category that is checked is listed as a primary priority. Murray, I can get through this. Okay, after saving the IEP, upload a copy of the actual IEP in the attachment section with the service area disability selected. For the description, it is typically either the initial IEP or IEP renewal. Again, type the servicing school district in the notes. Once completed, it should look like this. Remember, close the concern once the IEP is in place. 
Now, sometimes parents will bring up a concern for you to monitor. This should be documented in Child Plus, much like the screening concerns. The only real difference is the documentation is that you should enter that it is a parent concern and exactly what they're concerned about. And make sure to note what you're going to do, you know, that you're going to observe. So there are also times when all of the screenings indicate the child is within normal limits and the parents have no concerns, but after a couple months, you start to notice something that concerns you. This concern should be entered into child plus. The note should explain the concern, how you arrived at the concern, and next steps. I'll give you a second to read this example. Be sure to update all concerns each month until they are closed. All children should have activities planned which meet their educational goals. This is all children, whether they have concerns or no concerns. But children who have concerns should have one of their goals addressing that concern. And children who have an IEP should have an IEP goal in addition to the parent and teacher education goals. Each of these goals should be different. When activities are planned to support these goals, their initials should be noted next to the activity on the lesson plan. Before we go th over this in more detail, let's watch a video from the Office of Head Start about turning goals into everyday opportunities. Welcome, Welcome to this to short, short presentation, presentation on turning goals into teaching opportunities. This presentation is about ways to break down children's learning goals into smaller parts. Breaking down goals into smaller parts can make teaching and learning easier and more manageable. This module fits into the roof of our house. We use the house framework to illustrate the essential features of teaching and learning. The foundation represents engaging interactions and environments. There are two pillars. One represents research-based curricula and teaching practices, and the other represents ongoing child assessment. The roof represents highly individualized teaching and learning. All the features of the house are important for effective everyday teaching practice for all children. We have learning goals for each child, and sometimes a learning goal is just too big. It may seem overwhelming, and we don't know where to start, or a child may not be making progress. We need to break down the goal into smaller parts. Sometimes, we break down big annual learning goals for children with IEPs or IFSPs. Sometimes, we break down big goals for children with behavior support plans. And sometimes, we break down big goals for children who simply aren't making progress for a variety of reasons. First, we analyze the main concept or skill of a big goal. Then we think about the smaller steps of that concept or skill. This helps us guide children through small, achievable learning steps toward a larger goal. After all, the reason we set learning goals is to help children master the concepts and skills that are important for success in school. There are at least four ways to break down a learning goal and put the steps into an order that supports both teaching and learning. One way to break down a goal is to specify a smaller amount or quantity. You may want to limit the amount of time or the number of people or locations or items for example, a child's goal might be to sort beads by color. We could start by having him sort the beads by just two colors. After that goal is reached, ask him to sort beads into three colors. Start small and gradually make the task more challenging. Another way to break down a big goal and make it manageable is to provide help or assistance as you teach the steps. Think of this as temporary help or just enough help while the child is learning the skill. For example, a child might be learning to pour from a pitcher. We start by putting our hands over her hands while she pours. Then we provide less and less help over time as she learns to pour all by herself. Some big goals are complex. They have many steps in a sequence. We can break down the goal into smaller steps and teach them one at a time. For example, a child might have a big goal of riding a tricycle all by herself. There are lots of steps, getting on the tricycle, putting feet on the pedals, and hands on the handles, pushing down the pedal, and so forth. We can start with the first step and gradually add more steps, one at a time. There's another way we can break down big goals. 
we can put the steps of a child's learning goal into a sequence that builds on what he already knows. Before learning a big goal like having a conversation with a peer, a child needs to learn to take turns, to listen to a friend, to make a comment or ask a question, and stay on the same topic. The teacher can put these steps into a logical sequence that builds on the child's skills and interests, and then teach the steps one at a time. In this short presentation, we learned about taking big learning goals, examining them, and breaking them down into smaller parts. That can make learning easier and a lot more fun. We learned about four ways to break down goals and teach the parts. Smaller amounts, provide help, step-by-step, -step, and sequential order. All of these methods can be useful for children who need a bit more help learning their big goals. Take a look at our longer in-service suite to learn more and to practice breaking down goals to create teaching and learning opportunities. Check out all of our tips, tools, and resources. Thank you for listening. Okay. Now, the selected education goals need to be entered into the Education Notes section of the Education Information tab. The parent goal is identified by typing PG first, then goal. The teacher goal is labeled TG, and the IEP goal is labeled IEP. Each of these goals should be different, and at least one of them must be a social-emotional goal based on the child's DECA results. Once the goals have been entered, you can print a classroom report that will show you all the children's goals in one place. Simply type ED100 in the reports box at the top of the Child Plus screen. You will then need to select your site and classroom and check the box indicating enrolled children. The resulting report can be printed out to use when creating your lesson plan. Look at the activities you have planned and see which of the children's schools they support. Then type their initials under the corresponding activity. IEP goals need to be identified by typing IEP in front of their initials. Be sure to provide one activity each week to support the IEP goals of the children with one. Individual supports are designed to meet a specific need in order to help children succeed. This could be anything from adaptive equipment to an early warning for transitions. Each individual support you provide should be documented on your lesson plan, like you see here. However, you only need to document it the first time you introduce the support into the classroom. For example, if Tristan is going to be provided with adaptive scissors to help his fine motor skills, put it on the lesson plan when you add them to the classroom or his personal supply kit. You do not need to put it on the lesson plan again. However, if two months later it's decided that Susie also needs adaptive scissors, then put it on the lesson plan when you provide them to her the first time. The goal checkpoint assessment you complete each quarter is very important in telling the story of the child's developmental progress and alerting you to areas that may need additional supports. If a child consistently remains below expectations even after consistent individualized support, consider adding this concern to Child Plus and speak to your center director about it and then the family. Indicate the assessment results in the notes of the concerns and update the activities monthly to reflect the supports you are providing. Now it's time to learn about the IEP process. The IEP, or Individualized Education Plan, is a document which outlines a child's educational needs due to a disability and the services they will receive to help them learn in their educational setting. Every member of the team, such as the parents, specialists, special education teachers, administrators, and even doctors, are important members of the team, and everyone's input is important. The individualized program involves seven steps, as seen here. Once a concern has been identified, the pre-referral process begins. Pre-referral activities are used to screen children before any formal referral to special education is made. 
Teachers and family members work together to see whether educational or behavioral difficulties can be resolved in the classroom or at home. Pre-referral activities include documenting the child's difficulties and challenges through screenings, observations, and assessments, testing the effectiveness of classroom accommodations and modifications, assessing the success of at-home or in-the-classroom interventions, and monitoring the child's progress. If pre-referral if pre interventions are unsuccessful, the child is referred for special education services. A referral packet is created that contains the information required by the district they are being referred to. Parent consent is always required during this step. Their consent is documented on the A77 form. Once the district receives a referral, they have 25 school days to decide whether to evaluate the student or not. If they do decide to evaluate, then they will obtain informed consent from the parents. They cannot evaluate without this permission. The permission they already signed for us was simply allowing us to share their information with the district. The permission the district is seeking is to complete the evaluation. Once the consent is obtained, an evaluation will be completed by the assigned specialists. This can happen in a variety of ways depending on what is being evaluated and who is doing the evaluation. Once the evaluation is complete, a determination is made as to whether the child is eligible for support services. If they are not, a letter will be sent to the family explaining why. If you do not receive a copy, be sure to ask for one. If they are found to be eligible for services, a meeting will be set to review the proposed interventions. At this point, the parents will again need to provide consent to allow special education services to begin. The IEP lays out an appropriate education for each child. The child's participation in the general education curriculum, the accommodations the child receives, and the services to be provided. You will need to read this information to understand how you will be supporting the child's IEP in the classroom. At the first eligibility meeting and future reviews, there may be many different people present. This includes the general education teacher, that's you, at least one special education teacher, a qualified representative of the school district, at least one person who is able to interpret the results if any evaluations being reviewed need interpreted, and the parents, of course. IEPs are reviewed annually to ensure that the child is meeting their goals and making educational progress. Teachers and specialists take daily data and write quarterly and even weekly progress reports to help the parents see their child's progress and to help the specialists see what works and what they should change to help the child learn better. The IEP process can seem to take forever, but when the teacher and family work together, the process can go a lot quicker. Keep them informed every step of the way. Check in to make sure they know what to expect next and when to expect it. For example, let them know to watch for the consent for evaluation coming from the school district and share the IEP timeline right from the start. The most important part of supporting an IEP is supporting the parents throughout the process. They may experience big emotions, worries, doubts, confusion, and more. You have an opportunity to be their anchor through it all. Once the IEP has been created, be sure to read it. Know the goals and who is responsible for which pieces. Will they be going to the district for services? Will their support specialist come on site? How often should they be receiving outside support and for how long? These are all important to be aware of for coordination of services and to ensure the child is getting the supports that are identified. Then follow the cycle of reading the IP, selecting a goal to support it in the classroom, document the goal, plan activities to support it, then observe and assess the child's growth. Throughout this cycle, continue communicating with the family and their, about their child's progress and how they can continue to support them at home. Enter the IEP goal you have selected into Child Plus. It goes in the Education Notes box found under the Education Information tab in the Education section. Type it in the 
Type it in following the parent and teacher goals. As a side note, remember at least one of the three goals needs to be a social emotional goal and each of the three goals needs to be different from one another. Once you have selected the IEP goal, be sure to plan an activity to support it each week. Then type their initials next to the planned activity with IEP just before it. This is because you will also have activities planned to meet their other goals and this will identify which is which. Share observations and assessments with parents at each home visit using the individual child report in gold. As the year progresses, they will be able to see their child's growth and progress toward reaching their goals. And with that, we will conclude this portion of your training. Please remember to fill out your post assessment, turn it in, and have a great day.